This week, three sides of the coin. Ron Young, lead singer of Little Caesar, joins us. We talk about, or I should say, he dishes about Bob Rock, John Kalogner, David Geffen, Geffen Records, Jimmy Iovine, uh, Blue Murder, even Gene Simmons. Lots of Kiss and Gene Simmons stories here. This is a great interview taken oh, from. A... Go ahead. Oh, and some great ace talk at the end as well. Ace talk and uh, even vocalists singing the backing track talk as well. I know some of you are going to be like, oh, my God, three sides of the coin is talking about that. Doesn't upset us. We're not having a, a baby cow over it. Listen to it. It's a great interview. Is three sides of the coin talking all things. Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. You got, I was going to say the three that matter, but Lisa matters. She does. does. More than us, actually. Yeah. yeah. She gets the ratings. Mm-hmm. Although I got to tell you, the numbers for last week's show when I was, wasn't on... I should be firing all three of you. You should be like going off with Ralph and starting your own podcast because you guys sucked. I don't know if we care enough to start another one. No, I don't think you care. <laughs> we don't yeah. care. Why don't you, next time, Michael, by the new year, threaten us with something that we actually give a shit about. I know. Something that actually would make you care. Yeah, um, like, like you're banning seafood in Florida. Exactly. <laughs> No more crab legs before recording. Yes. No more dinner after recording. No more hockey games. No more hockey. Blacked out. Exactly. As you guys know, I'm doing what I want when I want at all times. So I, I know. Really Mark, 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 Mark doesn't <laughs> listen. Mark never listens. No um, we've got an incredible guest coming up. Tommy, I don't know if you wanted to read any comments. Doesn't look like you came prepared anyway. I was yesterday, but there just weren't enough at the, that point because the show was too new. So okay, that's kind of yeah. what have I I expected out of you. Mm-hmm. Merry <laughs> Christmas, everybody! Happy <laughs> holidays! Yeah, Happy, yeah. Hanukkah. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year! That's my uh, gift to you. No comments. <laughs> our no, seriously, our gift to you is that Mark won't be recording next week. Right, it's all true. Mm-hmm. So you should be very happy about that. Um, all right. I don't think there's anything. Well, I mean, I will mention real quick in passing. I did get my, you can't fucking see it. I got yeah. my Kiss Alive 2 uh, limited sure edition red and blue swirl vinyl. Okay. And I'm, wear, I'm wearing the t-shirt. I'm wearing the long sleeve t-shirt that, nice. that came with it. So, you know, that showed up. But, um, you know. What can I say? It's I'm not going to listen to it. I just bought it because I got to have a Kiss Alive too because it's the best live album that Kiss ever released. Oh God, it's really late. I mean, it is getting late. <laughs> it is. Um. Okay. Anything else we need to to chat about real quickly? I don't no. think so. Yeah, stick around to the end. Comic Gold. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, oh. Belated because we're recording this beginning. Mm-hmm. A day after we, we recorded the interview. So we're recording this on Wednesday. We recorded the interview yesterday. Happy birthday to Peter Chris. And we do know what Peter Chris looks like. We know who he is. And we do actually like him. We but also you, know that Mark is not a comedian. But, but if you know who <laughs> I am and have followed me for years, you'll know what I posted on three sides on Facebook Go to wish Peter a happy birthday. Answers. One fan actually said it was slander for me to post those photos. I'm like, I think you need to go look at the definition of slander before <laughs> accuse me of slander by posting photos that aren't Peter. <laughs> Yeah, like I said uh, towards the end, you know, if you don't have a sense of humor, this is probably the wrong show. No, you, you exactly go go listen to something else. Um, we we love to play with you. We love to play with Kiss. We have no problems laughing at ourselves, laughing at you, and laughing at Kiss. 
Yeah. If you do, you're going to get offended just, yeah. just because we laugh. Um, all right. So this week we are joined by uh, Little Caesar lead singer Ron Young. Little Caesar's a band out of the 80s. They're still around and they're still active now. Um, Ron just released a new book autobiography called judge this book by its cover you can get it on amazon it's a thumbs up book it's got a bunch of stories of little caesar touring with uh kiss on the hot in the shade tour but it's also filled with a lot of music business music industry 80s rock and roll stories about the producer bob rock john Kalogner, geffen records um Blue, the band Blue Murder. He shares some, just some great stories across the board on all of this stuff, including stories about Gene Simmons and his interactions with Gene out on the Hot in the Shade tour, which, which are really funny. You know, like what did Gene say about Little Caesar when he was trying, to, <laughs> trying to get him off the bill? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine that? I mean, that's you're invited on a major rock tour. And the, and, the, and the headlining band wants you gone wants before you, gone. you played so a they, single note. So they, can get a, so they can get a different band on because that other band will sell more tickets than you. <laughs> and he, I give Gene credit, man. He, he, that, that he didn't mince words. And he, Gene backed up what he always says because it ain't about the music friends. It's music business. Exactly. And Gene, and um, Gene knew no one, yep. no one was buying tickets to see them. This this uh, this interview is a lot of fun. You're gonna get a lot of Kiss stuff out of it, but if you like just great rock and roll, hard rock, metal talk as well, Ron talks a lot about that stuff. Especially if you came out of the '80s, he's gonna talk about stuff that that you're gonna know about. You know, Motley Crue, Doctor Feel Good, and uh, you know, he even. We even kind of at the very end talk a little bit about bands and backing tracks. Mm-hmm. And lots he gives a he, he, he lot, lots of stuff to take in here. So let it roll and we'll see you at the end. Thecoin.com. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow and rate us on Spotify. Subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate your support. Hey, Three Sides of the Coin. I'm really excited to welcome. And and honestly, I don't know why Ron hasn't been on the show yet, because Ron, I've done podcasts with Ron on my music business yeah, yeah. and stuff. Um, we've got Ron Young from Little Caesar joining us today. Ron, thank you for sitting down with us here at Three Sides. And for those of you who don't know, this is what we're talking about. Judge this book by its cover. This is Ron's new autobiography that just my, came my out mem- my memoir memoir it came out what a couple weeks ago yeah it came out like two weeks ago you Are know, you se- is this is this this is self-published right it's self-published yeah you know i i worked with steve Olivas, who kind of put all this together you know my ramblings and all my ideas and he helped collate them really well and um yeah, it, it's, you know, one of the great things about Amazon, you know, is it you put it up and you like you're holding an actual book in your hand. So yep. I'm looking forward to adding failed author to my I, I, I was, I was, I was going to say now now that you're well, well versed in, in dealing with a musician yeah. getting screwed over, you've decided to become a, a book author and get screwed exactly, over. Exactly. Because, you know. <laughs> Maybe I can rekindle my heroin habit from this film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, it, but, but all kidding aside, though, it must feel incredible when you first got it in the mail and you got to I see. Did. It's like when I first turned myself on the radio. I opened the box and there's there's a goddamn book of my life standing right in front of me. And um, I got to tell you, it's a it's an amazing feeling, but it's also a scary feeling because. When you write a book like this and you're telling stories about everything that's happened in your life, you realize that you're risking losing a lot of friendships, <laughs> a lot of family, because, you know, I'm telling yeah. stories and you're doing nothing but risking relationships that were 
nice and I thought settled until I tell a story from 20 years ago and they get really super pissed off at either I told it or I told it incorrectly from their opinion. So, so far, the response from all of those people have been, has been positive. So I was going to say that, you know, most people in the music industry wait to write their memoirs until the people they're writing about are dead. Right. Or they're in the total <laughs> I don't give a fuck realm of their life. <laughs> exactly. Or, you know, they're I'm used car I'm salesmen car. now. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's interesting because you write it and you get the first draft and then you go in, you go, I don't need to tell that story. That story is a little over the top about somebody I care about. I'm going to hold that one. You know, I'm going to hold that one in private. I've got three other good ones I can tell, you know, because it's, you're talking about other people and some of the exploits. And, you know, you can imagine that when you're talking about band stories, there's some exploits that you've got to be careful about. Telling. Well, let me ask you this. OK, aside of something that, that that's would be criminal, for instance, but your exploits of what people would expect as a rock star being in a rock band you're surrounded by other musicians that were in the middle of all this. Yeah. What are they pissed about? It's not well, like they, they have to worry about the fortunately, the fortunately, they're not because good. Um, you know, there's first of all, as long as you know that there's one worse story about them, you know they're not going to get angry because they're like, well, okay, you know, at least you didn't tell the story that my other friend told, which was way worse, you know, and. <laughs> You know, okay. and, and there's things where, you know, the stories about people in my life who, like myself, are now sober, and they've told all of those stories because they had to for their own survival to come out and say, yeah, I was a wild man, and I did this, and I did that. And, again, it's just kind of rock star stuff, you know, people getting so hammered that, you know, that they're doing something goofy, nothing criminal, nothing, right. you know. But that's and, my point. It's like you guys have yeah. lived. This is your life. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It was your life. Well, it's interesting because there's one story I didn't tell in the book. We were down doing demos um, in Memphis, working with Joe Hardy, who had done a lot of stuff with ZZ Top. Great guy, crazy guy. And he played us a recording because down in Memphis one night, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis came in with this young, young girl. She was like 19 or something. And he was probably in his 40s already. And, you know, he would sit him down on the bench on the piano and they would record him singing and playing and basically trying to seduce this girl. And during this, he started telling the story of when he was a teenager and him and Reverend Jerry Falwell, who is his cousin that he grew up with, um, they went and broke into a jewelry store and stole all this jewelry. And they had a falling out for about 20 years because Jerry went, Jerry Lee Lewis went and fenced all this stuff and didn't give Jerry Falwell a cut. And so they had a big falling out. And he played me this and you're listening to Jerry Lee Lewis tell this story about, wow, if this got out about Jerry Falwell being, you know, this total damning, you know, because Jerry Lee got into the show business and Reverend got into show business, but in a different take, you know. Right. And all of a sudden, boom, there's this great story about their criminal activities when they were younger, which I'm sure Reverend Jerry would say that he was saved by the Lord and doesn't engage in such behavior. It's amazing how convenient that is, isn't it? Yes, exactly. The, the, <laughs> Just as long as you're in church on Sunday saying you're sorry, you can get right back to it on Monday. <laughs> With a check. <laughs> With, yeah. Yeah, oh, totally. Don't forget. <laughs> real real, real quick, Ron, Ron, meet Mark. Mark, meet Ron hey, Mark. Young. How are you? Good, sir. We, we literally, uh, we literally just got started, Mark, so you haven't missed Oh, good. Anything. Yeah, sorry about that. Just tons yeah. of family stuff, tons of work stuff. Just uh, So so for, for our listeners, there's definitely some kiss conversation that's going to come our way here but i want to start ron with you know i I'm, I'm a big fan of little caesar i've been a big fan i've actually done some work with you over the years um little caesar 
came out of Hollywood in the 80s. And, I, and I'm not saying that in that you weren't you were not the Motley Crue poison warrant yeah. Hollywood. You were completely the opposite. You were a true biker band. You weren't a, yeah. a band that a label made look like bikers. You were no. really bikers. And, and in fact, we put the band together to be anti-poison, anti-glam stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that band, but... No, you go in a different direction. Yeah, I mean, we were a bunch of guys that, you know, we wrenched on cars and motorcycles, and we knew that we could never look like women. So we just let our gro goatees grow, which we caught a lot of shit for, because they're like, why do you have facial hair? This is the 80s. Nobody had facial hair. Yeah. And... You know, and we, we dress the same off stage as we did on stage. And we try to be a really organic, down-to-earth, blues base. Yes, we had a strong biker following because that's the way we looked and that's the way we played. And we, we you know, blues-based sort of hard rock stuff was right up, you know, anybody going to Sturgis's alley. And so they marketed us, you know, in that realm. And it was not... It was not contrived at all. That was, it was the real thing. So, but so, what's so, nice about that? What's nice about that though is that it's given you a future too, with regards to being on these different bills, if you so choose. And because you have the biker following, you can play Sturgis and a lot of those rallies in different places that a lot of the motorcycle community goes. Yeah, and we we played at the 50th anniversary. Um, which early on, this was not when Aerosmith was, you know, playing when they were having like ZZ Top and Aerosmith. It was yeah. a smaller thing. It just kept growing and growing. But yeah, the 50th anniversary. But I got to say, you know, bands like Kiss or what, what's the Slipknot or um, any band that wears a mask, you can can be that until you're 90 years old you know <laughs> it's like yeah. your makeup. you always look it, young it's like you can oh exactly because you're always behind that you know but the question you, that remains though ron is will the 70 year olds mosh for oh, Slipknot? Yeah, I, I just get this impression of like all of the jazzies and the larks bumping into each other in the pit you know yeah. <laughs> with their walkers <laughs> yeah yeah uh, you know a bumper car pit you know yeah well, so, so Ron, you know, back to back to the '80s and where you guys yeah. were coming out of. So, you kind of at the time it looked like you hit the perfect, you know, sevens across the board. You got signed to Geffen Records, who in the '80s was the hot label. Anything yeah. Geffen touched, everybody thought instant success. You had everything from Guns and Roses to White Snake to to uh, Aer Aer Aerosmith, Aerosmith, you yeah. name it. You, you know, if it was a rock band, especially, Ge Geffen kind of was like the Midas touch. You had John Kalogner in your corner, yeah. who, again, John Kalogner is John Kalogner. Um, you had Jimmy Iovine in your corner. I mean, it's like you guys couldn't have brought together, if you had wished for it, a better team at the time to yeah. almost guarantee success and yet it didn't happen that's right because it, it, really quick ron ask mike what i uh what i texted him after i finished your book the the, the blue well let's do that the blue <laughs> murder story <laughs> the blue murder. <laughs> i swear to god ron i saw them open and don't get me wrong all great players yeah 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 no i thought they were terrible and yeah, I remember, yeah. And I remember going, this is the band everyone's talking about? Yeah. No, I I, I, when I came to comment in your book, I started laughing out loud. I'm like, <laughs> I know exactly what he's saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the problem is, though, is you can't say that to like guys like John Kalodner and not get in trouble. And I got in trouble for it, you know? Well, that Let everybody who's watching this, that's the basis for... Well, go ahead, Ron. <laughs> well, yeah, so here we are. We're signed to Geffen. We're getting ready to start, you know, making the record and getting launched into the stratosphere. And I'm what year out. was this exactly? This is like 1989, okay. you know, somewhere in there. And so I'm walking the halls of Geffen and Galadner pulls me into his office and he's going to have a big listening party. Now, so I'm in there and there's Al Corey, who's the head of, 
you know, radio promotion and John Kalodner and Eddie Rosenblatt, the president. And so it's all the big wigs. And so they sit us down in John's office and he starts playing whatever that Blue Murder first single was. Kelly Roll. <laughs> yeah. And they're bopping their heads out of time and, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's laughing and it's, and the songs are over, like, oh my God, listen to that. And they're like, do you hear that snare drum sound? And I'm like, kids don't care about a <laughs> snare drum sound, dude. There's no hook in this song. And the room went silent. And I'm like, you know, okay, there'll be a bunch of kids that'll smoke weed and put their headphones on and think the production's great, but it's an immemorable song. There's no hook, you know? And John was just like, couldn't believe that that came out of my mouth. He's this young guy who's never sold a record. And here's all these, you know, heads of the industry, so to speak, who are the titans. And I'm reminding them that a, a song's got to have a hook. <laughs> you know, it can't be about a snare drum sound. And I said, this is the problem with all this music nowadays. You're letting producers come in and take all of the great personality out of bands and putting a ton of reverb and all this crap on there. And you can't hear the band's personality come through anymore. You've ironed out all the wrinkles that make a band a band. And I, that was it. I was thrown out of the club. I, could, I was never invited back to give my opinion. And John kind of hated me from then on, because first of all, shaming him in the room amongst all these people. You told the truth. With, they couldn't argue with what I was saying. I'm like, okay, sing me, sing me the hook. Sing me the hook. <laughs> and they're like, I'm like, the hook is can't be a snare drum sound or a guitar solo. That's not, that's not what makes a great song. And a great right. song is what makes a great band. Ron, I, I was reading, I mean, just dedicated RIP magazine and all that. I, I was in still am, just matter of fact, just got my new cream issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just just one of those geeky music kit. I mean, you know, well, we <laughs> and, 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 and I remember reading the hype on and I couldn't and I and I'm like, this is don't get it wrong. I, I, individually a shitload of talent no, they're right? like a, it was a super group and and john sykes killer player i mean don't yes. get me wrong it's yes and and again but that's you know? not a good band and those songs aren't good and i again i had the exact and i've used that band as is what what as an example yeah. anyone else <laughs> thought that way so i'm reading i'm reading i'm like holy shit i've said that a million times yeah here's a band that that the, that you know everybody was gonna was talking about i'm like what's the problem there's no songs that yeah well but the difference is is you can say that for me i was like someone shit on the coffee table <laughs> <laughs> you you shit on the coffee table yeah, the totally. about ready yeah, yeah, to pay yeah. for your career and, and i did not back down from that my turn whatsoever i just let it there and i stood my ground and I, the truth. I got kicked out of the club, the listening club from then on, you know, so, wow. you know, but, it, you know, but it's funny because like guys like John Collard, I mean, he's a legend, but meanwhile, Aerosmith never let him in the room because they hated him. ACDC, I think Angus tried to punch him in the face or something. <laughs> so as legendary as Kaladner is, and, and of course, to his credit, but he takes a lot of credit for things. And I, I that, you know, the bands would argue is got, you know, it, it was in spite of John Kaladner, you know. Um, but again, this was the time when record executives were legendary and John became a legendary guy. And the funny yeah. thing was, is I knew we were in trouble when the record came out and I came in and I, gave him a t-shirt. We had two t-shirt designs for the first tour we were going out on. And John opens his closet and there's four stacks of different John Kalodner shirts. The guy had his own merch and he outmerched <laughs> us by double. And I'm like, that's his name, John. Every record, John Kalodner, John Kalodner. That was his little thing on every. So we were thinking of putting our name twice on everything just to mess with them, but we got shot down on that joke. I, I've, I've <laughs> always said that when when anybody who's behind the scenes, managers, 
label presidents, A&R, you name it. When those people think they become bigger than the musicians they're working with, you got a problem because their job is actually to make you bigger, not make themselves bigger. Yeah, well, I don't know if I told this story in the book, but I I had an, I don't think I did actually, I had this argument with John later on. I'm like, you know what, John, the difference? See, there's Benjamin Franklin, my Benjamin Franklin theory. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, Benjamin Franklin didn't invent electricity. He just discovered it. And you think you're Benjamin Franklin that invented the band. You just discovered the band. And the thing with electricity is if you stick your finger in a light socket, you're going to get shocked. And you think that you can change that, but you can't. The band is not, you, you don't invent a band, you've discovered them. Why don't you let them be the band? Quit sticking your fingers in a light socket because, and, and he got, you know, got mad about that. It's like, dude, I'm sorry, but we don't exist because you decided to work with us. We, we were a band. We wrote songs. We had these songs. We could go in with any producer. I appreciate your input, but why don't you just give the band the tools that they need and stop messing with it? And that's why you signed us. You signed us from the demos. You signed us from the shows. Just help us take that and bring it to a nicer, perfect level and quit trying to change it. And, you know, of course, who are you, you little taxied, axe murdering biker dude, opening your mouth to a guy like John Kalodner? And how dare you say that to someone like Bob Rock or Jimmy Ivy? But Jimmy gets it. You know, Jimmy knows that, you know, Jimmy's whole thing was he, he it's funny because he, he he was running AM Studios. That's where his office was. And so this great complex that did some phenomenal records. And so he was producing U2, the Rattle and Hum record. And he goes in there and they start when they, they've gotten some basic sounds and they started to do some recording. Jimmy goes in and he sits down and all of a sudden this huge dude comes in and he's just standing by the door. And Jimmy gets up to go leave. And the guy stands in front of the door and Jimmy goes, I got to go. And the guy's like, no, he goes, I got to go. And he goes, no, well, my employer over there, Mr. Bono says, you can't leave. Jimmy used to produce from a phone. They made him sappy. They wouldn't let him leave the room because he was notorious for just never being there when he recorded a record. He would come in and change the mix this, but Jimmy trusted his engineers and he trusted the bands and he, he was a very hands-off kind of producer, but not on that record because Bono wouldn't let him leave the control room. Pretty funny, but, you know, that's that's the thing. So there's all these different characters that, you know, especially back in the 80s and 90s, you know, Clive Davis and David Geffen and John Kalodner and all of these, you know, huge Bob Rocks and, the, you know, just giants of the record industry. And they got to the point where they their legends were surpassing their actual skill sets you know so so let's let, 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 let's let's move a little forward here so you mentioned bob rock who produced your debut album yeah. and and tying into something you sort of alluded to here you were and we you hear this and read about this from all sorts of musicians especially when they they are able to look back at the early days of their career where they're like shit, I should have stepped up and said, no, I should have stopped the label. I should have stopped the producer. But who am I to to tell this great legendary who so-and-so not to do that? There's that kind of intimidation factor that Kalogner had over you guys. How did, how did you, you deal with that moving forward, especially once you got into the studio with Bob Rock, who was coming off of... Dr. Feelgood from Molly Crew, who that was uh, actually that was a breakout. That was the way, breakout. the way that went down was Bob didn't do feel good yet when he worked with us. He had, he had the interesting thing is, is that Jimmy, I mean, um, Kaladner landed Bob Rock to do our record. We were supposed to go out and start recording. They got into a fight. I think it was over Blue Murder. And John goes, <laughs> you're not working with Bob anymore. We're like, why? We're all because we sat down with Bob. We said, listen, we want to do 
a different kind of record. We want to make a 70s record, like a Leonard Skinner meets ACDC kind of record. He's like, oh, man, I'd love to do an old school where you hear the band in a room rather than in an arena kind of thing. And he's like, oh, I would love to do that kind of record. So we're supposed to go up and start. They get into a fight. He goes off and does the Motley record. So we waited for eight months for him to finish that whole thing. So we go up to Vancouver and we start doing this record, just like we talked about, very stripped down, very honest kind of record. And right as we're getting to doing all the overdubs, Feel Good comes out and goes to number one. And all of a sudden, everything changed for us. Because now Bob Rock wasn't making a Little Caesar record. Little Caesar was making a Bob Rock record. And so he's got a reputation and a sound he's got to maintain now. And all but, of Ron, the time start, but, yes. But before you go any further, though, just for clarification for our listeners, what, in your mind, what is the difference between Little Caesar making a record with Bob Rock or the vice versa? Well, a producer should find everything that's within a band and take all their strengths and bring it to the forefront and iron out all the imperfections, but keep the personality there. That's what a great producer does. Gets great performances, comes up with a great space to put the band in and represent that sonically to a listener to form the brand's, the band's personality. So the producer is supposed to get that personality and magnify you know, all the good things and get rid of the bad things, hide them or iron them out or perfect them in a sense. When a band makes a producer's record, he goes in and plugs you into his template. So all of a sudden, all these drum sounds and all his reverbs and all his mixes, it sounds the way a Phil Spector record with his wall of sound. They right. have a brand now to protect. So, so do you, would, would, you, would you say that it's a possibility then that that's what happened to Kiss when they made Crazy Nights because they had just... Uh, Hart had just come out with that huge record and then they had Nevinson produce it? It's very possible, especially when a band is trying to, if a band is in a place that they're trying to evolve to a certain place or do something new and fresh, they go to a producer and he's like, well, let me plug you into my formula because it's working really well for this other act or acts and we're going to do the same for you. And when that started to happen with us, I mean, we were up there for six months and we wanted to do a record in like two months, just knock it out and let it just be an honest assessment of the sonic quality of the bands, try to capture the live energy, which is not what Poison or Winger or Warren or any of the current bands were doing. They had all these huge producers, you know, that were making them sound enormous with all the reverbs and all of the boom cannon drum sounds and we just wanted to make us, like I said, Skinner meets ACDC. Close your eyes and you can hear them in a, in a theater or in a, in a club even, you know, that they were, and leave the personality in there. Don't iron it out. And so when Bob, when Bob went to number one with Feel Good, all of a sudden we started to do, rather than one guitar overdub, each song had four or five guitar overdubs and keyboards and background singers and doubling of this and tripling of that and, he rolled in a, a big, huge 64-track digital machine and started just overdubbing like crazy. And so I call up Kalodner, and I'm like, hey, man, we're not making this record. And he's like, shut up. Just let Bob do his thing. He's a number one producer, man. Let him do his thing. And I'm like, you haven't even heard what he's doing, and you're just saying it's okay. So I called Jimmy Ivey. So Jimmy goes, okay, well, meanwhile, we're all up in Vancouver. We're not in Los Angeles where these guys could pop into the studio and listen. So we're up there a little mountain and I'm going, you got to get up here. And they're not coming up to listen to this. And we're just, you know, we're spending money, money. We spent $1.1 million making that record up in Vancouver because we were up there for six months. We all had our own apartment kind of things going yeah. on. And you know, it's crazy. And Bob was charging all this money and running up all these studio bills. So finally, Kaladner comes up and he listens to it. And he's like, well, you know, I think you should just let Bob do his thing. And I called Jimmy and Jimmy was like, well, right now I'm in a big fight with David Geffen. And so I don't think I should stick my nose into this because it won't go well. And 
there we that was it we're that's it we're making a bob rock record that's all we're getting out of this and we me and bob really butted heads over it and i just threw up my hands i kind of gave up i'm like well you know i've told you what i think i think it's too overproduced and i think you should get rid of like half those tracks guitar tracks and get rid of all those reverbs and make it sound like with the basic tracks i like because we we were lit we had little you know mixtapes rough mixes and i don't have them anymore because you know you don't hold on they're cassettes you know and you listen to them after the first couple of weeks of tracking and i'm like oh man this is going to be great and then all of a sudden there's five reverbs going on everything and it just became this big washy slick produced thing and we did a bob rock record you know you know and and before we hit the record we were talking about this I absolutely love your your debut album, uh, you know, and, and as I'm reading this, it's sort of conflicting me as as a fan going, wow, I, I understand what he's saying. And that sucks that this is what happened to the debut album. But at the same time, I absolutely love what I'm hearing on this debut album. So if it had not happened the way Bob Rock wanted it, would I have liked what the result would have been? You know, that's kind of that that catch-22 where would the result, I suppose here's the answer. The result would have been something you were happy with, but didn't well, necessarily let, resonate let with the fans. It, let me put it into the macro business perspective. The reality is, is that real new fans of music like you, who consume because you're just a consumer of music, if you want to go really big and get to all those people that music is, they listen to it as the soundtrack of their lives. And you, this is a new band that we're trying to break. You want the band's image to match the sound of the music so that it makes one big appealing package that makes sense. A lot of the stuff we were getting was, how did that pretty ballad that's really well produced with the keyboards and the reverbs come out of these axe murdering biker dudes? You know, <laughs> if you listen to a Rob Zombie record or if you listen to a Junkyard record or the Soundgarden's first record, these are the kind of that's how we wanted to come across like ACDC or Bad Company's record. You would have liked it just as much because my voice and the chord changes and the melodies. All of that would have been there, but in the big picture, when you go this down and this is the band in left and right, and there was a huge distance between the two. And of course, there's all of the fighting and the sale of the label and all these other things that really screwed us up on a business level that sunk, sunk any chances that we would do well in that six week window. Um, was they didn't do any favors to themselves trying to market this band by having us look so rugged, rough, and have the music be a lot polished. Because already musically, we were hearkening back to R&B style melodies, which are, which are pleasing to the ear. And we have like a Temptations cover on the record, yep. Yep. Uh, Aretha Franklin but, cover but on the record. That, that, I, I want to take you back to something you said in the book, and I'm going to give you an, a 100% honest perspective on again being the rock and roll junkie that i still am back in the day i remember seeing a picture of you guys <laughs> and it didn't match yes and i'm, I'm i live in detroit no you see i i i thought no, you see, you, you've been weaned on this music <laughs> yes but i i i remember honestly the first time I heard you guys, it wasn't that it was performed bad, just the opposite. It sounded great. I just but found then you the saw the picture. <laughs> but I, I, I found it lazy. That's what I'm yeah. like, why are these? Because I remember looking at the picture and I remember hearing the 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 Aretha cut. And I'm like, what did you just say earlier in the conversation? You know, ACDC meets Leonard Skinner. Yeah. That's not what I was hearing. No, exactly right. And because you said in the book, you said this is the song I wanted to lead on, and they, the record company's like, no, we're going to push. Yeah, we're going to push a, co a cover. And song. the cover is what turned me off. Yeah, no, and I'm like, 
I don't, it's funny because I didn't even want to record that song, let alone make it the first single. But and again, it's not that it's bad. It's, it's no, very but good. It's not, it's not the band. It really isn't. Ooh. You know what I mean? It's like we did those songs as a tribute. We wanted people to know our R&B roots and we wanted to do our own treatment to it. But that's... Should have been a B side. That comes third single in, you know? Yes. Just the fucking... But they... No, Kaladner. All Kaladner kept saying was, Van Halen broke with their cover of, you know, You Really Got Me. And I'm like, so what does that mean? <laughs> you know? But again, you can't go against John Kaladner. John had all this weight and all this power. Yeah. He said, you got to record that song. We did it for John as kind of, well... We want to play along with the a and guy. We don't want to start having a fight with him right now. So we recorded it. And then when he said he was making it the first single, we were like, oh, my God, no, bad choice, bad choice, bad choice. And no, nah, they went with it. And I'm like, see, we should have never recorded it. Then he could have never put that out as the first single. But again, and then when you listen to the production of it and you look at a picture, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I, I want to give you a really real... I want to give you a real world example. And, and, and I want to hear how you tied in towards the end. I did the same thing with the four horsemen and went bravo. Yeah. yeah, yeah no. One of my favorite albums, but, but their look wasn't terribly different from yours. No. But and they sounded because, like that. Yes. And that and to this day, you know, uh, not very, uh, the first one, um, not, nobody said it was easy. Yeah, yeah, Actually, the said first it was one's right. And rocking is my business. Yeah. yeah. Oh my. To this day, yeah, no, one of the greatest that's, songs ever. That's that's it's funny. That's because, that's my point. I I because I think that's your point too. This is what we sound like. This is what we look like. Yes. Why don't you match this on the debut right away? Because that made me exactly a four right. horseman maniac when that came out. I'm like, I could not get again. Then I I'm like, okay, the EP. I you just couldn't get enough. Yep. No, that, and that was exactly our point. It was like, listen, man, you can't you can't make this slick produced record and have the band look so rugged. So what did what did what happened? John Kalani called and said, listen, you gotta all shave your goatees and put on nicer clothes. <laughs> so we did it. We went to the spaghetti factory here in LA that had a whole bunch of red velvet couches and we put on polka dot shirts and I shaved my goatee off. And a funny story, I, I don't know if I put this in the book. Uh, all of the, the photo shoot pictures they printed up and they were sitting on Jimmy Iovine's desk and John Bon Jovi came in. He was doing some recording for Jimmy's special Christmas album. And John was familiar with our band and he looks at the pictures and he's like, what the fuck is this? And he's like, oh, well, you know, Kaladner wanted the band to look prettier and all this. And I get this phone call at home from, I thought it was, the number comes up thought it was Jimmy Ivey, and John Bon Jovi called me. He's like, don't do it. Don't release these pictures. you got to stick to your guns. Whatever. This is what I like about the band. This is what it is. This is what I like about your voice. It's rough and it's rugged. Don't try to look like you're in winger because there already is enough wingers. So, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm, again, stuck between a rock and a hard place. How do you convince the label now that they put out this record where all the edges were taken off the band? The band's got to soften itself up. That's the only thing it could do. And it's funny because, you know, they sold the label three weeks after the record came out. And the marketing manager was fired four weeks after the record came yeah, out. Yeah, your timing was horrible. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jimmy Ivey got into a fight with David Geffen over Interscope. So we we were we were the battered child in the in the wedding of three in the marriage of three people between Bob Rock and Jimmy Ivan and David Geffen and they, all these guys were fighting and you know and we're the little kids sitting in the corner getting abused and neglected nobody's fed us you know nobody's bathed us kind of thing and so it all went into the toilet but it, the thing is though is that you you know you. you you, you got to let a band be a band and you can't really, and it, it just wound up being where all these great minds who couldn't sit down in a room without butting heads on an ego level, couldn't take this and do anything. They couldn't fix it. It was, it was too far gone. Um, financially, it was too far gone with everybody's bad ideas. 
and we just got thrown to the side, you know? So it happens to a million bands, you know? Well, I, you know, I want to ask you about that, Ron. So, you know, again, we've heard this similar story about how labels, I was telling you before we hit record, Blackie Lawless has shared the story about how Capitol Record changed the original recording of the debut Wasp album, and he didn't really like it. He's hoping to release the originals. We've heard countless artists say that's happened to them. When you are a new, young band with no muscle, no clout, no history, do you have any ability to prevent that from happening? None. <laughs> you, you have none. Because you can't tell a guy who's got platinum records all over three walls of his office that they're doing something wrong. <laughs> it's like the blue murder thing. They just look at you like, get the fuck out of my office. Who the fuck do you think you are? How many records have you sold, asshole? And I'm like, uh, well, you got a point there, but, and they don't want to hear what you have to say. And they plow forward and nobody's running the ship. You've got three egos pulling on the rudder in three different directions. It's not going to, it's not going to be a focused, you know, a focused approach. And that's really what happens. And it's funny because, you know, after the fact, yeah, it would have been great to try to remix that record or take it, you know, simple, but it's already out there and they're not going to get behind it. And they're not going to, they just want it. Basically they want it to go away. And that's what wound up happening is we were an embarrassment because I mean, First of all, we got the largest record deal for any new band ever signed at that time. It was a record, you know. Um, again, that doesn't mean anything. They can break a contract in two minutes if they want to because labels write the record, the, the contracts in their favor. So the largest record label, record deal ever signed for a new band. And then, you know, with Jimmy Iovine involved and all these people involved, there's all this, you know, big money getting thrown around, which they're just grabbing up all this budget and the band's, you know, tally is going up. That means we've got to sell so many records to break even. And then if it doesn't come out and immediately explode, which it didn't because there was 10 other things going on behind the scenes, they just want it to go away because it's an it's a it's a black mark on their record. You don't put up that, you don't put up the little Caesar poster and people go, ooh, you put the platinum record up on the wall and everything goes right. But if you look at it, John Kaladner didn't break any new bands. He would take bands like Aerosmith, who already had legacies behind them. Same thing happened with ACDC. He came into the picture and started working with them. So his name goes on the record. But at that point, once a band starts selling records, they have enough weight to throw around and tell these people, no, this is not how we're going to do it. We just couldn't. We weren't in that position. So we had to just kind of go with it. And, you know, did you did you have did you have fans? Because you were you were telling an interest this interesting story in the in the book where you were getting airplay, you were getting added to yes. all these stations, but they couldn't find product. Well, what, what had happened was so we come out, uh, Abby Konovich, who is the president of MTV at the time, saw the band in L.A. Said you send me send me any video of this band. It's going into every rotation. I love them. This is the kind of music I'd love to see come back into style. So we did the Chain of Fools video. He put it into heavy rotation. We got 120 ads at radio the first week. We start climbing the charts. It's like number 78, and it starts going really well. We're like three weeks into it. The record label gets sold, and all of a sudden. Geffen is now distributed by BMG, not Warner anymore. So here we are on MTV. Here we are on the radio. The initial pressing sell out. All of the product is going for Geffen is going from Warner Brothers over to the BMG warehouse. That takes a good month, six weeks, two months. So it got to the point where our record wasn't even available in stores. So we weren't showing up on any sales anymore because our records weren't in the stores. And when the sales numbers come out, it's not very impressive. 
A week after that happens, the label manager gets fired. So there's nobody running DGC records, which we were on. And like I said, a band gets a six week window. All this money gets spent. All the trades are watching this because they know Jimmy Iving's involved and they're on MTV and on the radio. And all of a sudden, no records are in store. So no records are getting sold. There's no records going on to sound, sound scan charts. And we look like a failure. Now, all of a sudden, all these guys just want us to go away and want people to forget about us. So they just stick us on a show. And that's exactly what happened. They're like, you know what? We're just going to move on to the second record. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You had all these great plans for this record. We spent $1.1 million on it. What do you mean it's just going to go on the shelf? So they didn't do, they didn't do a follow-up video. So we did Chain of Fools and nothing. So that's when they started with the, you know, shave off your goatees and put on pretty clothes and they released the ballad. And then all of a sudden people are searching the name and, you know, you know look, looking for it. Because remember, this is pre-internet, you know? So they're looking in Rip and they're looking in Kerrang and they're seeing the photos from the biker band. And all of a sudden we've got this pretty ballad that's going out to top 40 radio stations. And so they sent, the, they sent all the promo CDs out without a picture of the band. And we started to get all these ads and all of a sudden they started to realize that it's the biker band doing this. And they dropped us off the playlist too. So it was just this, this like I said, it was a, it was a, a, a path that they started on that was really badly thought about from the beginning and they couldn't course correct. And, you know, with a new label, a new owner of the label and a new distributor, and we had to get rid of Jimmy Iveen because in the state of California, once Jimmy started Interscope Records in the state of California, it's illegal for a record distributor to also manage an act. So David Geffen got us to fire Jimmy Ivy because, because why not? He doesn't like Jimmy anymore. So we had no manager. We've got no label manager. There's no records in the stores and the labels sold to another company. In that six week window, we just looked like a failure. And they just decided, okay, no second video, no second single, you know, nothing, just go away. And so, listen, you know, it's my career. For John Collard, it's just another record he puts up on, into his collection and just moves on to the next band, you know? Hey, we gave it our best shot. So hey, let's, uh, let's go a little, being that this is a Kiss podcast. Yeah, Gene um, stories. Yeah. Well, <laughs> more so than Gene stories, everything that, that you know, you you kind of did. Let's go before that because when you got on the Kiss tour, you didn't even have an album out yet. No, it it, it was just coming out like in two or three weeks. So here we are. Nobody's heard of us. We get on there, and the funny thing is, and this happens on a lot of tours. It's not just Kiss, but it would say, you know, doors at eight o'clock. And literally, Gene would put us on stage at 8 o'clock. So the door is just open, and there's a band already playing in the arena. <laughs> the door's open, and they come in. And we're playing to maybe 1,500 people. By the end of the set, there's maybe 2,000 people, you know. So it's just all these kind of shenanigans. And, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, we went out there, at a time, this is the Made in the Shade tour. And so Kiss has got their, you know, they're all wearing, they're not wearing Kiss makeup. They're wearing, you know, skin colored makeup. And Gene is giving me shit because I have a goatee. And then funny, it happens that six weeks after our tour with them, he's growing a goatee. So, you know, all of a sudden he's a grunge rocker, you know, because everybody from Seattle has got a flannel shirt and a goatee and Gene's Gene's now dressed in organically with the goatee because he's a smart guy. He knows fashion trends and he knows, you know, so he was giving us crap about that, you know, and you should really wear cooler clothes than these, this biker shit. You look, you look like the people in the crowd, you know, a band should not look like their fans. You're supposed to look like rock stars and like you're from outer space. And I'm like, well, you don't look like you're from outer space anymore. He's like, no, 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 no. We toned that shit down, but, you know, so 
Yeah, so it's just weird. We get on the tour, and about a week or so into the tour, that's when we go into heavy rotation on MTV. But while we were out on that tour, see, the spot we took over was it was Kiss and Winger and Slaughter, and I think it was Faster Pussycat. So we're out there, and we got on because Winger dropped off because they had to go in, and their label didn't like the record. They thought they needed to, to do a stronger lead-off single. So they had a great song. They went in and recorded it, and they thought they were going to be out of commission for at least two months. So here we are on the tour. It's us and Slaughter and Kiss. Well, when Winner dropped off, ticket sales really went in the toilet. And they were doing maybe 70% sales of what they were doing when, when Winger was out there with them. So Winger gets their record done and they're like, okay, well, we're ready to come back on the tour. And Gene's committed to Jimmy Iveen because that's how he got on the tour was Jimmy spoke to Gene and Gene did Jimmy a favor and stuck his new band out on tour. So Gene's like, well, we got to get him off the tour now and get Winger back out here because we need to get ticket sales back up. So I think I told the story. Gene calls up Jimmy Iveen and this is still one of the greatest lines I've ever heard because Jimmy, we, we, we got to get this band off this tour. And Jimmy's like, why? He goes, they're going over like pork chops at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> and Jimmy calls me up and goes, he says, you're going over like pork chops at a bar mitzvah. And I just started laughing. I'm like, that's one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. So now remember, this is pre-internet. So the day after every one of our shows, they're picking up the reviews in all the local newspapers and sending it back to Geffen and they're rave reviews. They're like a real rock and roll band. And these guys are, you know, the singer is this and the guitar playing is that and the songs are this and it's really down to earth and it's blah, blah, great, great, great reviews. So Jimmy's like calling up Gene going, I'm reading the reviews. They're sending me the thing from the Dayton this and the Cleveland that. And he's like, no, 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 no. They're scaring the kids. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And Gene's like, well, your audience isn't even kids anymore, dude. They're like, you know, you've been around. So what Gene didn't want to say was he needed to get us off the tour to get Winger back on because they were actually canceling shows some nights because the ticket sales were so weak. And, you know, Paul used to come out every night and go, you know, hey, you made this sound number one. And all his crew would go, I was actually only number nine, you know, <laughs> it's like, but that show business, Gene and Paul would always say that they were number one and they were selling out. And if you've got a half filled room, they'd rather cancel and not have it come out that they're, you know, doing 35% rather than hundred percent of ticket sales. Cause Gene and Paul are smart businessmen. They, they know, they don't need the money. They cancel the show and they all, and the, the big joke was, was that, Every time they canceled the show, they'd say Paul was in a car accident. So that was sort of like, you know, he's fine. He's going to be okay. He'll be back. He's, but you have to go to the hospital and get checked out. So we have to cancel tonight. And he'd be back the next day when ticket sales were much better. So we played in New York City. And the next night, I think we were up in Binghamton, I don't know, something. And there was, there was some show that had to cancel. And they said Paul was in a car accident. And we had a couple of days off when we go back to the next show and Gene's limo pulls in and gets out and we're talking down in the, underneath the arena, you know, in the parking structure. And then the limo pulls in and there's Paul gets out and he purposely comes over to us. And right as he's walking past Gene, he's like, huh. he's all offended. And he walks right past him and goes toward the, and Gene's like, what? What, what, what did I do to piss you off now? And so Paul comes back. He goes, I'm in a car accident. You don't call. You don't send flowers. Nothing. And Gene goes, what do you mean you were in a car accident? He goes, I was in a car accident. He's like, I, I didn't know. I thought you were doing this because the ticket sales were bad. He goes, no, I was in a car accident. And you didn't even call. And we're like standing around going, oh, my God, we're watching our Jewish grandparents. They're having a fight here in the he was so upset and Gene was so, I'm sorry. I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I, of course I would have called. I didn't. And, you know, it's just kind of a truth bit them in the ass. He actually was in a car accident out on Long Island when he had a couple of days off. And 
So we all thought it was the same old excuse. It was bad sales, but you know, it's just, I tell you, man, I'm, I was so blessed to get to be around those two because I mean, there's so much contention about Gene. I mean, Gene is larger than life and he's a total character. And he always said stuff that like, he wouldn't let us watch Spinal Tap. He made us throw away Spinal or our, our DVD, our, our VCR tape of Spinal Tap. Because if he came on the bus and we were watching Spinal Tap, he'd lose it. That's not funny. I can't believe you think that's funny. They're making fun of our lives. That's not funny. <laughs> it's an insult. And how can you watch that? Take that off. And we would like pop it out of the machine. Oh, sorry, Gene. You know, I don't ever want to see that again. That's not funny at all. And we're like, oh my God, this is our life. And this guy is angered by, <laughs> you know, and he was serious, you know? And so he didn't like to, you know, he used to watch us play every single night. And he would come back after our show and critique our performance. And he had every one of us down. He'd imitate every single one of us. And he'd go, okay, stop doing this and start doing this, you know? And like he would tell me, you need to get a microphone stand. You move around too much. Slow yourself down. You're on a big stage. Everything is enormous. Make all your motions a lot more, you know, pronounced because it's got to project to the crowd. And we learned so much from him. But a lot of the stuff we would argue, he would say, you know, you keep going out there and saying, how many of you hate your boss? Don't say that. You got to go out and go, how many of you like to eat pussy? They want to hear about pussy. They don't want to hear about jobs. <laughs> Show business. They want to forget about their job. Talk about pussy. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. He's like, none of this working class shit. Stay off the goatee. Quit talking about jobs. Talk about pussy <laughs> or something. Talk about a motorcycle or something. But money? You don't talk about money. They come here to see it. They want, the only thing you should talk about money is how many shirts do they buy? You know, and it's like, it's like you guys care so much about the music. It's not about the music. It's about whether the pyro goes off on time. It's yeah, a good show. Funny. When the pyro goes off on time, that's a good show. Doesn't matter. You can play like shit, but if you hit when the lights hit it right at the right spot, that's music. That's and he's like, you're not a musician. You're an entertainer. Don't forget that. And we would sit there after the show, and he would come in, and it, it, he cared. I mean, he really cared. We used to laugh when he left the room. Well, and yeah. Oh my God, this is this is Gene Simmons, and he's yelling at us like our grandparents, you know, and. You know, I, you know I, I'd, I'd love to see the Gene Simmons Rock and Roll Academy that oh, you can God, go yes. that you can go to. It's not about teaching you how to play. It's not no. about teaching you how to write a song. It's teaching you all the stuff you just talked about. No, I know, and that's and that's the thing. He's a master, and what kind of shocked us is, you know, we were kind of offended because we wanted we used to argue with him like going dude music is changing man it's not about the big hair and the makeup and the show it's about music's got to get back to being honest and we're trying to just be honest we you know this is when we wanted the record to be honest and less produced and so we were on this big campaign remember this is before alternative this is before seattle and we wanted alternative music to be Getting back to blues-based, hard rock, honest, stripped-down production bands, which is exactly really what Soundgarden and Nirvana, if you listen to those records, they're not big records. They're honest, broken-down records. Now, you might not like the whole grunge thing, but from a concept of going away from the big, that's what they did. And so that's what we were on a campaign to do. And then the interesting thing was what really changed all my opinion about Gene was because he was yelling at us about it's it's not about you being a great musician because we would he would come in and we would act, start talking about equipment you know with the guitar players and he'd say stop asking me about equipment that that's that's musicianship talk about entertainership talk about I want to know how, what kind of a sparkly suit are you going to wear tonight don't tell me that you got some new Gibson could give a shit about your new guitar you know. And we'd be like, oh, my God, you know. So we did a show in upstate New York, and we had a day off. And 
the hotel was right next to the arena and there was this little bar there with, that had cover bands playing in it. And so we had a down night. We went over there to hang out and she comes in. And I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? He's like, yeah, I want to get out of the hotel. And he's like, um, you guys feel like jamming? And we're like, yes, of course. So the band finishes and he tells them, you know, I'm Gene Simmons. We're going to be taking your equipment over. <laughs> and they were like, okay, you know. And so we got up there and we played for like two hours and we played Motown songs and classic rock songs. And he was so good. He knew every one of these songs and he, he nailed all the parts and he nailed all the singing and the harmonies. And he had this grin on his face and he was totally at ease and different than I'd seen him on any show that he had done with him when we opened for him. And I, my opinion of him completely changed because he is a guy that is just as rabid a lover of music. As much as he wants to talk about the sales and the shirts and the pyro, this guy loves music. He, to his core, he knows all these songs. You wouldn't know all these songs if you didn't love all these songs. And he was telling stories. He'd say, he'd start playing like a Who song and he would be like, he'd stop and he'd go, this is the lick that I stole when I wrote this song, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, and then he play a little bit of the Kiss song. And it was just a little piece of it. And what he was saying was where he got his influences, you know, where what moved him to write the music that millions of people love, that he, too, was being just like us, where he was a lover of music that was so moved by music that he grew up on that he had to put it into his own his own wanted to get that same feeling and he put it into his own music and my opinion of him completely changed and i was like dude you're you're just like us man <laughs> you know you love this shit as much as us and all of this talk about you know ticket sales and shirt sales and i get it you're a businessman but at the core of this man the music is you know is and he was like yep yeah, no, no no it's got to be right i get it but you know so I was like, you know, man, he's he's really uh, he's, and you know, you see him as personalities like this too. Like he, he can be a real arrogant, sort of dictatorial, nasty guy when he wants to be, and then he can be a completely warm. Like I used to go into the dressing room every night, into their dressing room because you know they had a full turkey, they had a full ham, they had a full roast beef. And they couldn't eat all that. There was enough food for 30 people in their dressing room every night. So we used to go in and he'd be like, no, go ahead, go get some turkey, get some, you know, whatever. Don't eat catering. Catering sucks. I make sure we have good food and there's more than enough. And we would sit there and he'd make egg creams like he was in the, oh, I got to have my egg cream. We loved egg cream. You know, your drink and all this <laughs> stuff. And we would eat and, you know, his kids and Shannon would come out on tour, you know, when he had, the dressing room would be just packed full of toys for the kids and he'd be playing with them. And it's just like, and he'd be like, well, I got to go put my wig on and go rock and roll now, honey. So, you know, he'd pat the kids on the head and he'd take the wig off the styrofoam thing and start putting on all the makeup and his clothes. And, and to just, you know, boom, all of a sudden he became Gene Simmons, larger than life, getting ready to go put on a show, you know? And it, it's just, it's funny because, I'd talk to him and he'd be like, you know, I haven't taken a vacation. This is what he said at the time. I've never taken a, a vacation in my life. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I'm, I work all the time. I work. And he told me he was Liza Minnelli's business manager at the time. And I'm like, you're what? He's I'm Liza Minnelli's business manager. She wants me to watch her money and look at her career. And, and he goes, and I'm really good at that. He goes, I'm just really, really good at that. And, he loves the business. He loves running the show. He loves running the business. He loves, he just wants to sell one more thing, hit another milestone. It, and again, for him, it's not about why, why get high? You know, why smoke a cigarette? You just hurt your body or you're, you're ruining your own consciousness. I want to be conscious all the time to keep an eye on my business, keep an eye on my life, keep an eye on my music. And all these other bands are out there hammered every night. They don't even know what they're doing, you know? And so he would just preach about all these things. But, you know, it's like this larger than life guy that was, and it was funny because every night 
Like we only got one sound check on the whole tour. The first time we came out, we did a sound check. Never got another one. They would go out there every night and they would just, sometimes it was with Paul, sometimes it was just Gene, sometimes it was just Paul. And they would noodle around on cover songs and they would tell jokes. And at the time they had a, a their tour manager was, I think his name was Charlie Hernandez. And every night he would read from the book of Burl and he would go out First thing before the sound check would start, all the crew would stop working and he would read some excerpt from Milton Berle's book. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the way the day started. Reading from the book of Burl and he would tell some story or tell some joke and then they would start sound check and they would noodle around and dick around so that no other band got a sound check. And then they go to their dressing room and do what they had to do for the next three hours until it was their turn to get up and play. And we would sit there going, they're just dicking around up there. We sure, I'd love to get a sound check before we get out there, you know? And they're like, oh, well, it's 7.30, doors are at 7.45. And I'm like, well, the ticket says doors are at eight. No, 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 we moved it. So there were some nights we went on at 7.45 and they didn't even open the doors till eight. <laughs> so it was like, you know, but that's because they were minding their business. They were like, well, we're starting to see people leave at the end of the night because some of our fans are old and it starts to get long. So we're going to start, get this thing rolling. You guys cut 10 minutes out of your show and we're going to tell, you know, Slaughter to cut 10 minutes out of the show. We're going to go on earlier. You know, it's like, you can't tell them no. So <laughs> that's just the way it rolled, you know? Well, so, so Ron, let's, I could go on forever because I love talking to you about the music business here, but we've already been like an hour and a half on yeah. this. And these have been some amazing insights into Gene. Um, what's Little, you know, Little Caesar's still active. Yes, you guys are. are you, 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 to lay down. <laughs> you, you know, ironically, well, I shouldn't say ironically, um, you tour Europe almost every single year for years. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what's it like? It's hard for hard rock metal bands to tour the U S it's much easier to tour Europe. Why is that? Well, first off is the logistics of any band touring the U S you can go from one city in Paris to a city in Belgium. It's three and a half, four hours away. The culture is different. The fan base is different. Everything's different. You can drive across Texas for 15 hours and still never hit another town to play in. And that's expensive to do and difficult to do. So because everything is so spread out in America, everything is more expensive. Hotels, crew. So it's way more cost effective to go over to Europe where you can go from one country to another, to another, to another, or you can do six songs and six shows in one country and totally different, you know, fan base of people. So we do it predominantly for that. Also, we had a bigger leg up in Europe that we ever got in the United States because oddly enough, Geffen in Europe was different than Geffen in the U S and they, People appreciate um, blues-based music in Europe more than they do in the States, which is odd because blues is a, a, is a native U.S. thing. But people over there, and especially in Germany, there's a huge blues scene and a blues, hard blues scene. Um, and bands can do better there because, you know, the structure was radio was very confined. Um the fans are a lot more rabid over there for stuff, um, for a lot of music. Uh, and um, again, densely populated. They do a lot of festivals. And it's grown to the point where the fans over there are still way more active uh, because of the, the, the festival season. You've got Hellfest, Download, Sweden Rock, all within like two weeks. And these, you're talking 50 to 100,000 people. And so fans, they, they still have this ability to take a whole summer and it's a music summer. 
So it's still culturally really, really important to them. Where in the United States, people are a little bit less um, motivated <laughs> because, you know, there's the, um, the density of bands that come through like the city of Austin is not like it is for the city of Paris. It just isn't, you know, and on the bigger side of things, you know. Um, so it, it's just financially, it's a lot easier to do. And, um, you know, between social media and word of mouth, um, we've gotten to have a, again, we're not playing like arenas. We're, you know, we're playing big clubs, you know, and small clubs. We, we play some places, man, it's like 80 people and it's packed to the rafters and we can barely fit on the stage, but it is so much fun to do those shows. And, you know, it gets us to the next bigger show, which may be a festival day. And it's just really impossible to do that in the States, just geographically and logistically. Um, so, you know, we're constantly getting people on Facebook, you know, come play Tampa. You know, it's like, well, we're in Los Angeles. That's kind of difficult to get up and just go play Tampa. And so, if, like, see, say we come to Florida. Okay, we can do three or four shows, but to get to Florida, that means we either got to drive, whatever, 3,500 miles or fly five guys. It's, it's expensive to do. And then we have to rent a van and, you know, get all the gear. And so it's, it's much harder to tour in the States than it is over in Europe. What, what's uh, Little Caesar's upcoming plans? Albums, touring, what are you working on? Well, now that, now that COVID has stopped shutting everything down uh, and the fact that one of my best friends and our producer finally has his studio just getting back up and running, um, we have some song ideas, definitely an EP. Uh, and depending on how many songs people have sitting around that we can finish, maybe a full LP. And, you know, we're trying to start doing weekend fly dates in the U.S., you know. Um, you know, listen, we, we're not doing this for money anymore. This became, well, that opens you up to the festivals during the summer here in the yes, States. Yes, and like we played M3 and yep. we, were, we were supposed to play on the Monsters of Rock Cruise, but one of the guys came down with COVID and, you know, so <laughs> hoping that kind of stuff stops. But, you know, we don't we don't. We don't do this to try to make a living. We just try to break even. And even if we lose some money, you know, we don't care. Some guys go hunting. Some guys go fishing. We, we go play music. So if we have to do a fly date into Indianapolis and, you know, Detroit or whatever, we do it. So we're trying to put all those together now, now that COVID has stopped. And quite honestly, you know, like talking before we started recording, Michael, you know, people getting COVID – you know, I'm not a spring chicken and our fans aren't spring chickens. And so it's hard to get people to pack into a club when COVID is still around and they run, run in the risk of getting anywhere from mildly to pretty hardly hit with a prevalent vaccine right now. And when you got like Netflix, you know, people, it's harder to pull people off the couch. And a lot of bands are experiencing that. Plus, now that bands have been off for three years, they're all dying. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's over, it's overkill right it's now. It's overkill. The competition to try to even get an open slot. Venues are booked 18 months out now. It used to be eight months. Now it's 18 months. And, you know, the problem is, is that these bands are taking really big risks because the guarantees, you know, these promoters and these venues after COVID and them getting shut down for years and not getting a lot of support, say a band was used to getting the $2,000 guarantee. Now they're offering the band, you know, a thousand and then a percentage of the door. And they're basically telling bands, listen, we can't take a chance that between Netflix and COVID nervousness and all this, we can't guarantee you're going to make 2000 bucks like you did three years ago because there could be a big outbreak here in town, like two weeks before you come, and people are like, you know what? Well, well, well plus, 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 if you twenty five bucks, if, if you don't take that deal, there's six other bands behind you. Well, that that's will. the thing, and and so a bands are going. Well, if we're ever going to tour again, we're going to have to take those deals. But what's a band supposed to do when they're supposed to rent a bus or a van and get on a flight and get their backline together and a couple of crew guys or whatever they're going to do? 
when their guarantees are half of what they were, that means they got to make an investment on the front end and pray to God that they sell all those shirts and that they're covering those hotel bills and they're covering the, you know, the rental bills and all that stuff because they're on the hook for it. And so there's a lot of anxious musicians out there that are going deep into the hole of taking risk on these tours that they're booking and praying not to mention that now that there's three years of bands backed up all trying to compete and get out there, there's a lot less, you know, there's five shows and five bands. Before there was two shows and, you know, two shows and five bands and they were all doing well. Now people are going to pick, start picking and choosing what festivals they're going to go to and what they're going to, you know, because it used to be that, that you know, it, it's, it was a summer long thing or a weekend thing for a whole bunch of people like Monsters of Rock or M3. And I'm starting to see a lot of comments on social media that people are getting sick and tired of the same old bands, you know, that, that some of these festivals keep running the same bands through and happens. Well, yeah, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of truth to that. We have one here locally uh, in the fall. You probably have played there, um, Rock Timber, which uh -huh. is in Hinkley, Minnesota. And a lot of 80s stuff. And I think there was a period where it seemed like it was the same bands over and over. Now, last year, they changed it up, which was great. And I don't know if that has more to do with the same bands being out on the road or if one particular event has a specific promoter who has this group of bands underneath their, their umbrella. I'm not really sure how that all works. Well, you know, the thing is, and we did this and we've been, you know, again, you mentioned earlier that we're really not a hair band. We got thrown in with all the hair bands at the time that we came out, hoping to be something different. Mm -hmm. But people remember us as a band from the Sunset Strip. So all of the offers that we get for these festivals, we're playing with the Bullet Boys and, yep. you know, and Warren. And, and people see us and they're like, uh, this is just a rock and roll band. This is not. But those are the dates that we keep getting offered because that's our contemporaries. That's our peers. Yep. And to be quite honest, that whole genre of music is one or two original members and a bunch of 25-year-olds that, that know how to play the songs. And I won't call out any names, but there's a bunch of singers from that genre that can no longer sing anymore. And they should stop trying to sing. I'm talking. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, they can't stay. I mean, dude, just stop. And the thing is, and it makes me upset because I see the fans. The fans are so loyal to Bon Jovi or Dawkins or, or Motley Crue. And, you know, these, they, they have a trouble holding, holding it down, you know. And the fans don't care. They really don't. They don't care if he can't hit the notes. They don't care if he's faking it. You know, a lot, I won't mention any band names, but there's bands that, a lot of the vocals are pre-recorded, you know, something based around this podcast, you know, <laughs> it's like that, you know, won't call them out because from the fifth row back, nobody can notice it's any different and it sounds great and they're giving the fans what they want, but there's a lot of fraud going on um, and, and a lot of fake stuff and a lot of guys who can't really pull it off and I don't think it's open well, the you even talk about in your book, though. I mean, let's be fair. And and look, I, I'm on record as, I, I look, I just want to go to a show and have fun. But back in 1989, Kiss was using samples. No, yeah, I talked about it. I talked about it in the book, you know. Look, it's yeah, like, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, and they were, it was just background vocals. It was just like a chorus. And a no, lot of, I, I, and I, I get that. Those guitar so, parts. You know, I, so I get that, but uh, people people seem to think that this is some recent phenomenon. No, no, I know. no, 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 no. I, I, we, no. We try on our show a lot of times, and I, I being, I, and I'm in Detroit, one of the big, big things back in the day, this was mid-70s, ELO on, uh, it was probably 77, 78, all the backing tracks, and people yeah. were demanding refunds. My point is this. If you go to the show and you have fun, that's the most important part. So many bands from Queen to Rush to Kiss, to, they're taking samples. They're taking everything you see isn't the guys playing, a, no. you know. 
No. It, because no. it's show business. It's show no, business. It's, that's exactly right. And that and that's like what I was getting to is, you know, I hear these stories and it makes me angry as a performer. And if somebody was taking care of my voice and I can still sing, I've only lost like one note in my range. I can still sing all my songs the same way it sounds like on the record. And, and I'm lucky. There's other guys who can't. The reality is, is that the fans vote with ticket sales. <clears throat> so if they're yes. buying them tickets and they're showing up and they're putting on a show and every, and like Gene says, if the pyro goes off on time, it was a good show. <laughs> you know, People and, just want to go have fun. That's, that's the whole it. reason they leave their house. And, oh. and look, I, I, I was, you know, it's funny because I said the thing I did about Don Dockin. I'm not a Dockin fan. I, it's funny. That's a band. I think the guitar player, the bass player and the drummer are fantastic. I never liked his voice, even back when it was good. Right, He's when just you, not when somebody. You can actually sing. But, yeah. yeah, but but here's the difference, though. On some some, if you look terrible, you look miserable, and yeah. and I've seen Don yeah. just does not look like he wants to be there. Doesn't look well. It's not singing well. Right. Look, man, if you're not going to come out and 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 put on a good show, then stay home. You know, say yeah, what you will about, you know, uh, Vince or Paul or whoever. They're coming out there energetic. They're coming out there with, you know, the, the full Monty, as they well, say. Well, Vince is energetic for a few minutes and then he has to catch his breath. But <laughs> <laughs> that, that happens to the best of us. I'm lucky to play on small stages. So I can run across. I don't, I don't yeah, yeah, when you run across a small stage, you're only running 10, 15 feet, exactly. not, not 100 feet. No, no, that's exactly right. Well, well, so, look how many kids. That's what it is. He's got I'll give you another to cover. <laughs> I'll give you a really weird kind of example. I'm a big Ian Hunter fan. And oh, back in, in the in the spring of 2019, Mott the Hoople with just a few members that were from back in the summer. But I love Ian Hunter and I love Mott the Hoople. I was happy I got to see him. And yes, I know. I'm like, okay, that isn't, you know, all the same right, guys. Right, right, right. And, and, you know, Buffin's dead and as yeah. is, you know, the bass players. Dead. But man, I got to go see Mott. I, I, a band I always loved. They were just done by the time I was old enough to see them. And and it was uh, funny, too, because, you know, last year I saw Mick, who's, you know, in his late 70s. When I saw Ian Hunter, he was 79 and turned 80 a couple months later. You would have thought he was in his 40s. You know, so that's I mean, I'm, I'm happy for the fans, especially of Kiss fans. If they're a younger fan, they're getting to see them now. At least you're getting to see something that you love because even at my advanced age i was happy to see i can check mock the hoople off on my bucket list that's how come i really wish that zeppelin would tour with jason i never got a chance to see Led zeppelin i wish that they'd at least do a tour so i could go see yeah so, so you could get the essence i have a quick funny uh Ian Hunter's story i was working the door at a club in los angeles and Ian hunter was was playing and there was maybe 25 people there, if that. Ugh. And he, yes. And I'm standing there and I'm my I'm just like, oh my God, I feel so bad for this guy. There's nobody here. He's Ian Hunter. And he does a bunch of songs and he's given it his all. And he's like, uh, he's end of the song, he's like, um, listen, I'm getting the sense that you feel weird because there's not a lot of people here. Don't feel bad for me. I'm having a great time making music. <laughs> and don't feel bad for me because I've made a lot of money. David Bowie has sang my songs. <laughs> he made me a lot of money. So I don't feel bad that there's not many people here tonight. They're missing a great show and a great time. And he played for another hour. And it was like, wow. And I met him after the show and he was so nice and gracious. He didn't give a shit. He was there to play music and have fun. And yeah, he I was a hundred percent. Yeah, I saw Ian. I've seen Ian Hunter a few times. I that was the only time I saw Mott the Hoople. And it was great that it was a Mott. Because when I'd go see yeah. Ian Hunter solo, he'd play, you know, half dozen Mott the Hoople songs, but this right. was nothing but Mott. Yeah, but Mott, yeah. Uh, you know, it was just uh, you know, just just fantastic. So I, again, oh. you'd like to see bands come out. You know, another band I never got to see was Slade, and I love Slade. Yeah, you know, I much like Bobby Holder. <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, I'll I'll ne probably never get a chance, but 
you know, there's these bands that if they even came like that and advertised and had most of the original members, I'd, I'd go, you know. That's... Yeah, a lot of it is a lot of it is the way they approach it and the way that they present it. You know, if if they come across with it in a sort of a humble sense and they're doing it for this or doing it for that, like like you talked about the four horsemen. I filled in for Frank on a tour. That, I wanted that because I gotta get yeah. going any second. So I, I don't want to rush it, but could you yeah. please how no, you know, Frank got into his accident? He was in a coma in the hospital in a coma for a very long time. The record label, which was based out of Canada on the second record, really needed to get the record out and wanted the band to, to tour. That's what they kept asking. And so Dave Lisby, the guitar player, called me up and said, listen, we're doing this. Would you fill in for Frank on, on a tour? And, you know, you don't have to try to copy him. This is just we'll talk. We'll say it's in tribute to Frank and we'll do the old record. We'll do the new record. And so I did. And I went up and we did all those songs. And, you know, it's so funny because, like, you talk about the fans. People will come up to me and go, Frank. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, like they're hammered drunk they're like Frank I love you and I'm like I'm not Frank Frank I love you I I'm not Frank Frank I love you I'm like thank you thank you yes I would just say thank you yeah. they, they just want to hear the songs they just wanted to and unfortunately Frank passed away not far after that and it was a great experience great songs great fans oh, we, try to, fans we try to keep it going but everybody was too scattered around the US so we couldn't do it yeah, the barely getting by album. I, I didn't like it as much as the first, you know, the EP and the first. Yeah. There was some pretty solid stuff on there. You know, yeah, I, no, totally. Again, it's just rock and roll. Like, you can't yeah. really go wrong, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, I, I got I got to run. So yeah, well, Mark you, Mark's got to run. But by the way, hold on, Ron gets my. You guys know I I love the book. I thought it was fantastic. Go buy this book. This book is fantastic. Thank you. Really, really I appreciate that. Great job on it. Thank Ron, you. Ron, where can uh, our listeners find out more about Little Caesar? Um, well, you can go go to our Facebook page. Um, you can look up and, all and, and, and it's not the pizza joint. No, 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 no. That's another story in the book. Yes. <laughs> How we got the name. Um, you know, there was no pizza chain in California called Little Caesars. And the label knew about it, didn't even tell us. And they let us put the record out. Like the record got delivered. They're like, oh, well, hopefully, you know, there's not going to be a problem with the pizza company. What are you talking about? Uh, there's a pizza company with the same name. Well, when did you know this? Oh, we've known it for months. Didn't you guys know? No. Oh, we thought you knew. No, we, we would have changed the name of the band. We don't want to be a pizza company. Anyway, long story. Band name she got, never got changed. And Little Caesars Pizza started opening up in California. Every single day we hear that pizza pizza joke and that's okay <laughs> so you can find stuff of us on youtube facebook um spotify you can you can listen to all our music our, our new music i like even more than our older stuff because of the way it's produced it's produced more in the way you know again you go in and make a full record from the beginning of getting sounds to mixing down in 20 days and they're not even full days in the studio. So that's how we like to make a record. Just set up the mics, get a good sound, do a couple of overdubs, mix it and go. And I think there's some really good songs. It's a record called Redemption. There's a record called Eight. There's a record called American Dream. And there's some videos from those records. You can find any of that. Like us, please, on Facebook, because it really helps our reach. And... Um, Yes, if, you, if you'd like to read a story about a failed musician who's now going to be a failed author, please pick up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write judge my next the, book about Judge being a this book author. by its cover. <laughs> no, I, 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 just like Mark, I can thumbs up. Um, you know, great stories. Kiss fans are going to love it. There's a lot of Kiss stories in here. Yeah. There's a lot of music industry behind the scenes stories in here. You are very upfront, honest about what you say here. You're not yeah. like you're not like protecting yourself and sort of saying a little bit. You come right out and say yeah. what you think. I listen. I got. I've got nobody to please. I got nothing to prove. I don't have a career that I can destroy. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't have a music career to kill. No, exactly. You know, 
it's so whatever. I don't have a label. I don't have a manager. I, I have an attorney if somebody wants to sue me, but they would come take my dog, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They'll take your goldfish. I'm going to tell the truth. And I tell a lot of truths about myself. Yeah. My own frailties, my own weaknesses, my own struggles. Fortunately, I recovered from all of those. And I try to be, if anything, helpful to other people who might uh, feel like they've tried to do something and failed and then they wound up getting into drugs or alcohol because they really feel kind of worthless. It's, it's a good story about why you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't feel that way. And, you know, what can what kind of life you can have if you get out of that. So anybody that might have substance problems can read it and hopefully find some inspiration in that because I had my own part of my story that was dark and now it's full of light. So that's great. And uh, yeah. And Gene Simmons, you know, he's not going to sue me over anything I said, but he might not like some of the stories. <laughs> you know? so what's he going to do? Not take you out on his never ending tour. Exactly. <laughs> right. You know, he, he already kicked me off the first one. So <laughs> I'm not expecting him to get on a second. You know, I'm just a pork chop at the bar mitzvah, you know. So. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Ron, it's it's always been a pleasure talking to you. You've got, oh, such you, great, you've got great, such such great honesty and insight in the music industry. And, and more importantly, unlike a lot of musicians, you still remember it. Yes, <laughs> I know. Even being in a fog, I still remember those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 exactly. I mean, there's a lot of people that just don't remember anything. It's it's so uh, worth getting. Head over to Amazon, judge this book yeah. by its cover. Thank I ordered you, it. I think I got it like within three days. Yeah, of ordering it from like Amazon. Three days. I was shocked. I, you know, because we wrote this thing and I didn't see a final copy to approve. I just figured, okay, the artwork looks good on the computer. And then I opened the box and there's there's me and a book that I wrote. It's pretty pretty fucking cool. I gotta yeah. say. You yeah, know, yeah. Just, just, just the process. I don't mean the book itself. I'll leave that up to you to decide. But just, yeah. just the whole thing, it's pretty rewarding. I got to say, it's a very rewarding feeling. And I'm really grateful that I met Steve Olivas, who, who put the book together with me. Uh, great guy, fun to talk to, and, and, and a really talented guy. And if it wasn't for him, none of this would have gotten collated into. Uh, into something coherent and and linear, should I say? <laughs> so. Yep, yep. Yeah. Ron, once again, thank you so much, man. This was awesome. Thank you, hey, Michael. Thank you, Tom. Take Appreciate care. Appreciate it. Happy holidays. Yeah. You too. That conversation with Ron um, was one another one of those super cool music in general and music industry. Uh, in general discussions, I thought. I mean, obviously, he had some cool Gene Simmons stories there touring with Kiss, but that whole insight into Bob Rock and John Klogner and Geffen Records, that was Blue amazing. Blue Murder. <laughs> yep. 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 I, I, so, you I, know, like, I like to see how the donuts are made, you know? I, I, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, like I started the, the interview off, it's like, Here's a band that, I mean, if you had asked anybody, especially back in the 80s, what do you need in your corner to guarantee success? Well, Geffen Records, John Kalogner, Bob Rock, Jimmy Iovine. It's like you couldn't have asked for a better pile of people. That was the dream team. That That's was the, the dream team. team. Yeah, exactly. And yet it didn't happen. And that just goes to show how so many of our guests have said success is as much the right time, the right place and the right people as it is great music. Mike, like I said, timeline yeah. is everything. Had that happened four years earlier, it would have been a different story. Yeah. 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 I mean, if, if, if Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood hadn't happened when it did for in, in the timeline with Little Caesar, Little Caesar might have been great, but Dr. Feelgood happened. And now all of a sudden you got Bob Rock, who is like, I'm God's gift to producers, and we're going to make everything sound like Motley Crue. Plus, like we talked about, too, I thought it was a poor choice for a, for a single. 
it just seemed lazy. I was that way because there was a lot of bands, especially, and I don't mean to pick on them, but unlike Motley, because Motley Crue, when they did, you know, uh, the the smoking in the boys' room, it, you know, it would just, the cover thing just, you know, worked. By that point, there'd been quite a bit of covers of classic songs. And to me, it just seemed lazy. Um, it it, it, it is. It, you know, it's kind of a general thought in the industry is like, you don't lead with a cover song. You don't the even release it. cover songs third, as singles. Or third it, single. Yeah, because it's like, especially if you're if you're a new unknown band, it's like, how does that, display your talents and your abilities you're just playing somebody else's music that was written by somebody else yeah. now now granted i think little caesar's covers are amazing i love them but i agree you know to lead with that as as a first single is just wrong i mean i've, I've always even felt that with ace it's like why does ace constantly release covers it's like you're ace fraley i mean is that the best you can do is just release a cover of somebody else and not right. don't get me wrong his covers are good but does that show his talent no not really in my opinion yeah totally agree you know and 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 you know extend that to i have never liked bands that get to that point where they do a whole album of covers it's like I, I'll, I'll buy it to support the band if I love them, but I listen to it once and I am done. I do not want to listen to you do covers of somebody else's tunes. I want to hear you do your own music. I would say that about most bands I like. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I absolutely, one of, if not the worst Ozzy releases, that undercover piece of shit that he put out, just bad, bad, bad. Um, that was really in the heart of when bands were doing that sort of thing. I just, again, I find it lazy. Um, it is. It's, it's, like, it's like, is that all you got left in your gas tank, so to speak, is, all right, we've tried everything else. We aren't getting anywhere. Let's do covers of bands that influenced me. It's like, okay, I, if I want to hear that song, I'm going to go listen, listen to, to the original song, not your cover of the song. Unless in a very rare instance, a band does a phenomenal cover where you don't even realize it was a cover. Well, I tell well, you what, and, Ace, go ahead, Tom. Well, I just say that happens sometimes because if you look at, at Ace Fraley, um, Bring It On Home, I don't like the Zeppelin version, but I love Ace's version of it. Oh, boy. Look at the time. Look, look, I don't care what you think. <laughs> I already know that we we our our musical worlds just only collide for short periods of time once in a great while. Um, and then uh, also too, I really like Fire and Water with Paul and and um, Ace. That I don't really particularly care for the other version. Oh my God! Hold you on, know, I gotta call. Hold on, I gotta call Liz. I, I'm Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> Calling me home. You want me to keep going to, to like guarantee this? Yeah, yeah, but no, you, well, you know, Tom, Tom, Tommy, I, you, I, I agree with you because, again, I'll support Ace in anything he does. Hold on, what did I you just say? I'll support Ace anything he does. Hey, Mitch. Hey, what's up? <laughs> wow. I, I have not. Harsh. I have not listened to Ace's. <laughs> covers albums <laughs> since they were released i i have not i don't put those in where it's like dude i'm, I'm feeling like listening to some ace fraley let me listen to him cover a bunch of other bands uh no i'm gonna put in his original material well and i like the i like the thing they did on the art of mccartney too sorry oh i, I oh, oh look, listen those Blaine. one-offs are fine the, yeah I, I, one of the best examples honestly is 2000 man it's better than the stones version I can say that wholeheartedly. And I love, as you guys know, I absolutely love the Rolling Stones. I think Ace's reworking, and that's the key word, he reworked that song. And I think that's what made it different, all joking aside, because we love busting each other's balls. Like, the Bring It On Home, 
he does a great job playing it, but it, it's a, it's just a straight up copy of the Zeppelin one. Whereas I think the 2000 Man Ace reworked but that song. I don't mind if it's a copy. I sonically I like it better. You know, I just enjoy that version. No, it's fair. It's yeah. fair. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I to your point though, I don't want a whole record of covers and especially certain ones. You know, like with Ace, a lot of the stuff he drew from, I know that it's stuff he listened to when he was growing up, but it, God, I don't want to listen to that mountain song again. Ooh, uh, it's probably my one of my favorites on the record. I'm, no, I, but my point is this: I, I still, if given the choice, I would much rather have him do Five Card Stud, Remember Me, uh, The Acorn is Spinning. I don't get whatever. Pick whatever songs you God want. Full of Rock. That is a song. Why? Yeah. Don't, especially with the yeah. three guitar attack that he has now. Well, and Words Are Not Enough is still one of my absolute favorite songs he's ever done solo. But my point is you could pick whatever you want. I still would rather have those over any of the covers. What a Girl Wants, I still think, is one of his best written songs. I absolutely love that. That I wish that song would have came out in the mid 80s because I think it would have got some traction. That is just a well-written song. And, uh, you know, it's just, just too bad it came out at the time it did. And again, I'm going to go on record next to the 78 uh, solo album. My Space Invader to me is I love that one. That's a really yeah. good one. Between that and uh, um, uh, Trouble Walking are probably my my two favorites. Well, Trouble Walking is amazing. Isn't it? But what a great fucking record that is. So, Alas, he's forgotten the whole thing. He doesn't play anything off of it. You know, he plays Kiss it. tunes. I mean, we get into that now. Now we're getting into that whole Ace Fraley discussion again. It's just like, dude, if I'm going to go see Ace Fraley solo, I don't want him to play Kiss songs. I want him to. He's got a deep enough of catalog of his own material to pick from. Yeah. Why not play your own stuff? Because the people in the audience are going to be diehard Ace Fraley fans. Yeah. I will tell you, I just saw Ace a couple weeks ago, um, and uh, you know, I can honestly say I, I thought it was a great show, and I thought Ace played very well. I would agree um, with that. You know, too. it was good, good seeing all the guys, and uh, I was lucky enough. Uh, thanks, Philly. I was able to sit. I used I Liz and I were able to sit on the stage and watch the show. Um, it was absolutely awesome, and and I tell you, everybody, uh, Rocco to. Night Bob, just what an incredibly wonderful group of people, and they Jeremy really and, and Ryan and Zach and just everybody, and you know, and again, I was happy. You know, uh, Rock City fucking packed the place. You couldn't have got two more people in there with a fucking shoehorn. So it's good, you know. Yeah, it was. It was a great night of rock and roll all the way around, and uh, you know, I was real happy. So uh, you know, that's a good thing, and. Uh, but yeah, you know, Tommy, put it this way. Origins 2 only exists, I think, because Origins 1 sold enough copies. To, I would think we wouldn't make a second one if you didn't right. make money on the first. Well, unless it's just as a label, they knew it was an easier enough, easy enough album to get Ace to record versus original material. Yeah, but Michael, you still have to sell X amount. You know, you got to cover the the publishing, and yeah, as well but, as. But I I I I can't imagine. I mean, no disrespect to Ace, but I can't imagine he's selling enough for anybody to be making any sort of money off of it. Well, if you're the record label, would you put up put especially in 2022? Would would you put something out you know you're going to lose money on because there's no other way to recoup? They don't get touring. I I think I think at the end of the day they see a covers album pretty much selling the same as an originals album it's going to the same fans and in the case of ace and yeah this is some listeners are going to take this the wrong way but you know the the, the label is going to go okay so if both of them would sell the same it's probably easier to get ace to record a bunch of cover tunes than it is to get him to write new material and record new material We'll get we'll get a covers album turned into us to release quicker than we would get an originals album. Is all I'm saying. Because right. I got to suspect they probably are going to both sell 
about the same. They're selling to the exact same audience. Who else is buying Origins other than knuckleheads like us? Right. You know, well, I, 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 what, I, I, mean, I don't, I don't, even... I don't see Led Zeppelin fans going out and going, "Oh my God, there's a Led Zeppelin cover on that Ace album. Got to go buy it." I don't think they give a crap. But I mean, they're even using that for Record Store Day. Would they? Didn't they just do a picture disc um, for Origins too? I mean, oh yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure they're trying be... to milk it all they can. Well, that's my point. I mean, if. I, I could not see there being a, a vo- that's, you know, there's a reason there's not music from the elder two, you know, it just, it, Hey, this is, we got to change directions here. And, and, you know, um, I can't see any there, any way they do a volume two of anything. If volume one didn't, you know, pay for itself. And well, and let's, let's keep in mind, it also could just be part of the, let's get him to fulfill his contract and then we're done. That's all possible too. Yeah, um, you know, I have not a clue. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. I'm not going to even try and talk. I don't know what his contract is or what it. You know. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know either. But I mean, we we do we do know historically with other bands, a lot of times that's what happens. You know, but he said, but he said, I could have sworn he said to me that last night that I saw him that he had just written a song with someone. I don't remember who. It oh was. no, he is he is working on an, an album yeah. of new material now. But I think he's been again. He's been working on that. I think for maybe a couple of years. Sure. It's. I tell you what, though, I, I'm gonna. As I said, what was what was the one after Space Invader that he did? Spaceman? Or was a was the? I'm just drawing a freaking blank. I so don't know. I, um, we're gonna get ripped to shreds for that. Yeah. Well, look, it's been a long day, as you guys know. But uh-huh. just so you know, I didn't imagine because when you when you enter or exit the interview we did with. With Ron, I was wearing a hat. <laughs> now my hair is washed <laughs> because this is the next day. <laughs> exactly. Even though so, I'm wearing the same shirt, I pulled the same shirt out of the, the dirty yeah. clothes hamper. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. I did the same thing. I did the same part of thing. I'm like, matter of fact, Mike, just because I had such a crazy, crazy day yesterday i'm like can we can we just record the wrap up tomorrow because there's just no today i fucking get home i just run home like a you know on ragged legs i just sit down and mike's like hey aren't we recording the wrap up and i'm like oh fuck because it was my idea so right. i hurry up hurry up run down here so so if i can't remember the records in order forgive me it's uh, trust me my my head is on work family response. We still love Ace people. Even if we can't yeah, remember yeah. the album, we still love Ace. Yes. And, and and guess what? We love Peter Chris. Oh my God. <laughs> Yesterday's was you got, if you don't look here's the thing. If you don't have a sense of humor, this is probably not the show for you. No. I, just God, throw no. it out there. God no. If 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 you if you aren't a KISS fan that can laugh at KISS and laugh at KISS fans you don't belong listening to this show and laugh at yourself. Yes. Cause we all yes. have to do that. Yes. All, all I'm going to say is I wished Peter Chris a happy birthday. Cause when we recorded yesterday, it was his birthday. So yesterday I posted a photo wishing him a happy birthday. And anybody who's been following us long enough would know exactly what kind of photo I would have posted. And the shit storm just blew up. Oh, and by the way, I was correct. It was Spaceman after Space Invader. So, okay. you know, so, so we aren't wrong. Yeah. So, you know, but yeah. Anyways, to go back to that, I, I, I'm, I thought Space Invader was better than Spaceman. Um, I also, too, would like to see him kind of kick the whole, that whole thing. Can just put out a record and don't have to. I, I said, I said that years ago. I'm like, how many songs are we going to get written about space? Is this, isn't it time to move past that? I mean, it's I not, so. ni- it's ni- not 1978. We know, listen, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We know Ace is not from the planet Jindel. Okay. Huh? That's not true, people. I'm sorry. Oh, it, oh where'd you read that? Probably Wikipedia <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah, he is. Huh? He's not. 
I mean, we, you know, and I've said this about Kiss. We don't need a Kiss album that's got one song sung by the drummer and one song sung by the lead guitarist, just because that's what had been done in the past. Hold on. What, what, God, we, man, it's getting late. <laughs> Like I want good songs. I don't want songs. Oh shit, Ace, we got to do a space song. Well, this is the best I got. Okay, well we'll make it work. It's like if that's if that's the way it's approached, it's like fuck that song. Go write Look, something else. Let's go back in time. I wish Hot in the Shade had, you know, a song sung by Bruce. I wish Asylum had a song sung by Eric Carr and one song by Bruce. I that's something I genuinely missed post Creatures, you know. I yeah. liked when all of them sung. Oh, I, it's what I, made I, my I, favorite I, band my favorite band. I, I, I get that, and, the, and and that's cool. But, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Kiss has now gotten into the habit after after the success of Beth and after Shock Me that it's like, okay, we got to throw one song to the drummer, and we got to throw one song to the lead guitarist. It's like, no, you don't have to. Well, if they, it's a great song, do it, but don't just do it because – that's what Kiss has done. Yeah, but the three of them sang, you know, everyone but Ace up until um, Love Gun and Rock and Roll Over. If you remember, Queen for a Day was supposed to be on there. And again, that's just a and I'm not going to go into that song here because but but if you're put it this way, I think if you're watching the show, you know what it is or what it's supposed to be. But anyways, um, again, that's what made my favorite band my favorite band. I love that. We've even talked about it on the show, like who, which one is singing that? I mean, when you first got into the band, because when you saw pictures of them live, you're like, wow, everybody's singing. And and you hear three different voices and you're like, OK, which one is that? You know, uh, again, I would have I would have hoped that younger fans, when they you know heard, um, you know, Sonic Boom and Monster, that they were going, hey, this is kind of cool that, you know, Tommy's singing or Eric sing, because both of those guys have good rock voices. Um and I like, I, honestly, I love those songs. I really do. I mean, you know, I, I I don't have a problem with the song, so to speak. It's just, I feel like it's it's a kind of a cheap gimmick that Kiss got attached to somehow. It's like, well, okay, I mean, may, hey, maybe Ace should sing three songs. Oh, but, you know, we can't have Ace singing more songs than Paul sings or more songs than Gene sings. Well, look at you know, Dynasty he, and, and, and Unmasked. Ace was finally getting, you know, three songs. Um, you know, we well, got, although, he had, he, although, as as Gene would say, didn't work, so why do it again? Well, look, he, he had more <laughs> songs than Gene did on Dynasty, and that was Platinum. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know. I just, I don't know. I guess I always go back to it's all about the song. And I don't want songs just because it's got to be written about space or just because it's got to be sung by a drummer. If it is truly a great song, great. But I can't remember which Ace album we were reviewing, but I said, it's just like, geez, here comes three more songs about outer space. It's like, this is, if it feels like so cheap, feels so easy. It's like, okay, we don't really have to try. Let's just another song about the planets. To a degree, I, I, I get that. But I, put it this way, the, the, the Ace thing, I'd like to see him kind of, we'll put it this way. I would have liked to see him move out of that. It's, 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 let's face it, it's towards the end now. If, you, if, we, if, this, if we get another record from Ace, chances are it's going to be the last one. Probably. I mean, yeah. all new stuff. Um, so, yeah, I want that. Just like, you know, John Five has talked about having a rock record with Peter. I want to hear it. Yeah, so you do know. I. Um, you know, because I, there's a guy who, unfortunately, and I'm not trying to rag on Peter, but I, I thought he would have been, he, his voice really didn't, you know, I didn't like I shouldn't say I didn't like um, his solo stuff right out of the gate, you know, from, uh, you know, out of control on. I, I actually liked the, 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 the Chris stuff, you know, it was a little bit more rockier. I, I liked that. Um, you know, it's, 
I don't know. I, I, w- I wish if you, had t- you could go back and put a good band around him and kind of feature him on half the song singing. Maybe his career would have been a little bit, a little different than it turned out, but it is what it is. But anyways, look, I, I always want more songs by Peter and more songs by Ace and, you know, Gene, Paul, Tommy and Eric and Bruce as well. I mean, more, more kiss like music means a better world. I mean, for all of us, that's why we're kiss fans. You know, ultimately we want to hear him sing and play. So I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I will, again, I'll support him. Uh, just just so there's an opportunity to maybe get one more and one more and one more. If we don't support them, it's just not going to happen. It's, it's you know, we've said this for over 10 years now. You vote with your wallet. And if you don't buy it, that's a vote to say I'm not interested and I don't want another one. Yeah, I mean, Peter just, down turned, Peter just turned 77 yesterday. I can't see him starting to record a new record anytime soon. I think I think we most likely got our last last gasp out of the cat, you know, and hey, is what it is, you know. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. So let's let's wrap this up. Uh homework. Um are were you were you familiar with Little Caesar? What do you think of their debut album? Um, what do you think of Blue Murder? You know, do you do you think they had what it seriously, did they have the songs, the hooks, the melodies, everything? We're not talking about did they have great musicians? Because that's a given. Phenomenal. Phenomenal musicians, but that doesn't mean they can they can write great hook filled songs. No. It's no different what do you than... think of the Blue Murder album? Because my my take is the Blue Murder album is an album that other musicians love I, I i remember when that came out and like all of the guitar players and bands were just like heads were exploding about that blue murder album. this is incredible this is incredible but it's like but that's a guitar player that's not the average kid on the street who's listening to poison like I told our guest, that was it with me. I remember my guitar player loving it. And I'm like, well, where's the songs? This, 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 you know, yeah, it's recorded incredibly well. Great tone, great playing. Great um, playing. I mean, I actually, I actually just went back and listened to it um, earlier today, since again, we're yeah, recording the, a day later. Where's the chorus? <laughs> you know, and and I, I had to stop after about five or six songs. I'm like, Boy, kind of this whole album sounds like one same song. It kind of all sounds the same. And and again, the musicianship in the plane is phenomenal. And and Jelly Roll's not a bad song, but it's not a song that's going to take a band and make them massive. Nope. It's not and cherry let pie. You, let's put it that I saw, way. I saw them live and I was very disappointed. Um and I forgot who they're opening for. I want to say Billy Squire. I think that's um, who they toured with. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I went and I was super excited to see them. You know, I was like, okay, well, like Kiss. I've had people say this. I like that. I, I like the live records better. They just sound better. Fair enough. That's a fair analogy. And I'm like, wow. Well, when I first heard the Blue Murder stuff, I'm like, okay, well, maybe it'll be great when I hear it live. In live, they were just. I was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Well, you know, he, they're, they're opening for Billy Squire. There's a guy who, that don't say no album. There's an album filled with great songs. Great songs. Great hooks. Great choruses. Great melodies. <laughs> you know, there's a Billy guy who can knew write how to chorus. do it. He, he, can, he can write. Yep. Yep. So again, homework. What do you think? What do you think of Little Caesar? What do you think of Blue Murder? Um, you know, what do you? What did you? Did you learn anything from Ron amongst his discussions of Bob Rock, John Kalogner, David Geffen, Jimmy Iovine? Uh, you know, I kind of felt like this was a, a great. Again, look as you said, Tommy. You know, it's how the donuts were made. Yeah, I enjoy stuff like this. It's fascinating to me. 
And any anything that you thought was funny about his his uh, Gene stories? I mean, I thought those were great. I mean, I I yeah. could see Gene being exactly like that. You know, that's Gene. Mm-hmm. Yep. I tell you what, I I uh, you know he was nice enough to send us a PDF of the book, and you know, I read probably ninety percent of it. And I'm going to finish it uh, um, here in the next couple of days. Really, really well written, um, incredible story that really gets into the. Put it this way: I would highly recommend buying the book and then re-listening to this interview because he added some stuff that wasn't in the book, and uh, you'll really get to know, you know, what a great rock and roller he he, he really is. I, again, um, you know, and this is coming from somebody who was not a Little Caesars fan, you know, at all. As a matter of fact, I thought he was really cool when. I gave him my honest assessment about stuff, you know, anything an argumentative or anything. He's like, Oh, you know, it's your take. Cool. And I, you know, I appreciate that when you have somebody on that's that honest and that honesty goes through the book. So again, uh, highly recommend great rock and roll. Yep. Read. You really yep. dig it. Ju- judge this book. Let's see here. Judge this book by its cover by Ron Young. You can find it at Amazon. Um, again, it's got pictures in there. It's It's got great stories about Kiss and Gene. It's got great rock and roll stories. I, I think it's safe to say if, if knowing our listeners, you will like this even beyond the Kiss stories that are in it. Yep, I agree. Um, all right, so that's your homework. You know what to do. Uh, I actually think we got a guest next week. I don't have my calendar in front of me. Hmm. We got a bunch of guests coming up and that we're trying to confirm as well. I, I will tell you right now, um, as today is the 22nd, today? today yeah, is 21st. 20, is it the 21st? 21st. Yeah, yeah so it's the right shortest there. day. That's right. So, anyways, today's the 21st. Today is Thursday. Um, no, today's Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, today's Wednesday. Today, yeah, this, that's what I mean. Like I said earlier, and mm-hmm. this, I'm just fucking. Um, we're supposed to get really nasty weather and everything. We've moved the Chikini Christmas to next Tuesday, so I'm not going to be available. Just letting you guys uh, okay. know because we got people coming out of town. And uh, uh, so there, there you go to our listeners. That's the three sides of the coin present to you. Mark that's won't be gift. here next that's week. Our, there you that's go. Our holiday gift to you. There you go. So <laughs> I won't be here next Tuesday. So, so I you can't want complain to... about lights on, lights off, microphones. Hey, the light, look at that. The, the I know. I mean, who do we have on next week? Is it Richie Blackmore? Uh, oh. uh, no, I think Blackie Lawless is coming back again. Oh, will you guys stop. Or is it okay. Carmen oh, yeah. Apathy? Well, and then we had Ian Gillen who said he'd come on. Oh, my God. You um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? I think we've got all of Judas Priest coming on. <laughs> all of them. All of them. <laughs> Even the original Judas, the original <laughs> Judas Priest members. There you go. So. <laughs> all right. So, hey, everyone, anyways, by the by the time you guys all hear this, um, it'll be past Christmas. So Christmas, Merry Christmas. Ha- Everybody have hope you had a great holiday. Merry Happy Christmas, Hanukkah. great Christmas, and have a great New Year because it won't be New Year's yet. No, that's right. The All reason, right. hold on. The only reason that I wanted to do this is the wrap up. As I was, you know, singing, uh, you know, all these great Christmas songs, and I'm like, there's only one person who can make the Yuletide gay, and I'm like, Tommy. So I had to make sure that we had to come. Really? You worked on that one all day. <laughs> that, that, so, comedy del- so... that comedy delivery would make Izzy proud. I know. That that's so that was so sad. I, I don't even feel like I need to say anything back. It just fell flat, just coming right out of his mouth. Are you which kidding a... me? Oh my god, that was that was comic gold. <laughs> <laughs> 
you need to do stand up with Izzy if you think that's oh, comic gold. Oh my god, I'm delirious. Look, I'm delirious. I, I, matter of fact, we're having my company's Christmas party in an hour and ten minutes, so okay. I'm going right from here, running right back out of the fucking house to go host a Christmas eat. party. So to eat again, eat. Yeah. All right, everybody. I hope you again. We hope you all had a merry Christmas. Great holiday, whatever you might s- celebrate, and uh, be safe, and we'll see you all next week. If you have something to say, leave a voicemail or send us a text message. Call 320-515-477 for three sides of the coin. Provided by LarryDavisVoice.com and by JessicaMarsVoice.com. That's Mars with a Z.